Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment, folks. This is Rick Adams, your producer and host for The Deadly Experiment. Deadly because it takes deadly aim at the enemies of our God, our families, our children, our country, whatever is left of it. Most of all, taking aim at Satan himself and his little children on this earth. And yes, Satan does have, as we saw in a previous show with uh, Dr. Compare, he does have children. He did begat children, just as God begat his children. See, the Garden of Eden was a perfect garden, but the serpent, Satan himself in serpent form, the Nokash, that is the shiny one, the glistening one, that's what Nokash means from the Hebrew. It means the Nokash, Satan, slippery, smooth, glistening one. He appeared not as a snake on a tree, but he appeared as a tree of death, but a tree of life to Adam and Eve. So we know that that tree represents a being, a human being, the two-legged being, not the multi-legged being or the slippery one that slides on the ground and slithers. People don't understand. The scriptures make sense if you let them make sense, if you understand the original Hebrew, the original Greek, and then you teach people from that basis of truth. Friends, the whole world is deceived today like never before. And yet the whole world is coming together as never before. That was never possible before this generation that we live in. What generation is this? Well, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if he's your Lord and Savior, and the apostles and the prophets before them all said the generation would be the evil fig tree generation. How can a tree be evil? Well, the tree in the garden was evil. That was the tree of death. The tree being Satan. Okay, you understand that now? Satan, the tree, not a physical tree, an apple tree with apples on the tree. And God said, don't eat of that tree because the apples will kill you. You'll die after that. Friends, that's all fiction. It's all fables. It's all nonsense. And it's all done because the world is not ready to know what it means. God's elect do, students do, teachers do, true teachers of the word. They understand what that tree represents. But if the whole world understand it today, then how could the world be deceived before the end times? That makes sense. Now, hold on. It makes a lot of sense. The world will be deceived. The whole world will follow after who? After the devil. Satan coming as who? He's coming as Jesus. He's not coming with a pitchfork and horns. He's not coming out of Halloween, friends. That's all ghastly, nonsensical, and gory imagery from the synagogue of Satan in cinema. That's Hollywood. They want you to think of Satan as ugly. His deeds are ugly, yes. His purpose is ugly, yes. His destruction of souls is ugly, yes. But he's not. He's beautiful. And when he comes to sit in that seat in Jerusalem, posing as Jesus, the mercy seat, he's going to be coming as a beautiful, beautiful creature. The whole world, it says, except mine elect, will be what? Deceived into thinking that's Jesus. Why? He's going to perform miracles. They haven't read this word. You're not studying the Bible as you should. Every day I study a chapter at a time from the Word of God. If they're short enough, two chapters. I'm in Jeremiah now from Genesis. Chapter to chapter, verse to verse, word for word. Are you? Are you studying his word? The King James is fine with a concordance so you have the correct words. And James Strong's exhaust, exhaustive concordance is one of the best, if not the best that I know of. Not perfect, but it's very good. Then there's the Moffat translation and so forth. But now we get a better understanding of the words. There is no tree, an apple tree, that kills people in the Bible. Not in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 15 onward. It's Satan. So what does he call the tree? 
in Jerusalem in the last days, he calls it the evil fig tree. Isn't that ironic? It's the same thing. Figs, how come? Because that's what Adam and Eve used to cover their genitalia after they partook of the tree, meaning they had sexual intercourse with Satan, the serpent in the garden, and produced children. Now, Adam produced his son. He did not produce Cain. Satan produced Cain first. Two brothers, though, and the pregnancy continued. The word continued in the Hebrew, I believe, is yasha. Yasha. So the yasaf means to continue in labor. Abel was the son of Adam, the son of God. Cain was not. He was the son of the serpent. And who are Satan's Canaanites and Kenites today? That is, descendants of Cain from that garden onward. Well, they're those who call themselves Judah and are not, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. There's a difference, isn't there? Big difference between light and darkness. So Cain is the son of Satan. And Satan, yes, does have children on the earth. Not children who follow him, but children who are blood-bought, blood-bought, sperm-created children of the devil. The sperm of Satan in the Greek. They bought and paid for by the synagogue of Satan. They don't look like that, do they? No, Satan doesn't look evil. He looks beautiful. We see rabbis, we see churches, we see synagogues, we see all these people who claim to be God's chosen people in Jerusalem, killing and murdering and destroying. But they do it with a smile on their face, don't they? Some of your best friends may be of that tribe, of the descendants of Cain. And they appear outwardly to be beautiful, don't they? Friendly, you can get along with them. You can go to a ball game with you can go to a, a theater performance, a movie theater with. They're just like us, but they're not. Inwardly, Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, you have good clean fingernails, you take a bath twice a day, you're pure on the outside, but ravenous wolves on the inside. Oh, does that throw you? Does that make you angry now? I'm telling you too much truth. I know some people want to kill because of that. I'm not saying anything that Jesus didn't say, but they did kill him, didn't they? Sure did. They killed the prophets, didn't they? Sure did. They killed the apostles, virtually all of them, directly and indirectly, didn't they? They sure did. So what is Jesus talking about in Mark? Chapter 13, Mark 13, the Gospel of Mark. What did he say in verse 2? Jesus said to his apostles, look, he said, answering them their questions. Do you see us thou these great buildings? Where? In Jerusalem. Do you see them? Not left one stone, he said, when I come again. What do you mean, master? He says, when I come again, will you see a stone upon another? Or will you see buildings and structures and temples and Knesset's? and monuments, Holocaust monuments, and so forth. What would you see? Well, he tells us in Mark 13, in that second verse, he says, I tell you now, there will not be one stone left upon another standing that shall not be thrown down. Upon this Mount of Olives, he says, over against the temple. Remember, they slew Zechariah between the altar and the temple, or the porch and the temple. Who did? The Kenites, the sons of Cain, from Genesis 3. So we see that tree again, that tree of death, planted in Jerusalem in 1948. That generation will not pass, Jesus says, until all these things be fulfilled. And there shall be earthquakes, and there shall be famines for hearing the word of God, and there shall be pestilences, and there shall be wars, and rumors of wars, volcanic eruptions, all of these things will multiply. But the end is not yet. The end comes when Satan comes. 
and Satan bearing the mark 666. You know, you see that, that symbol up there, the synagogue of Satan by Andrew Carrington Hitchcock, his book by the same title was banned from Amazon. Why? Didn't say anything that wasn't true. Because those who control the media, those who control publishing houses, those who control academics, those who control the politicians and the economic structures of the world now are the same ones who killed Jesus. The same lineage from Cain in the Garden of Eden. Now, do you understand? Very simple. The tree of death. Fig tree is what? The figs is what Adam and Eve used to cover their genitals. The fig tree in the end will be the camouflage of the evil ones who would rule over the world when Satan comes. They want their evil Talmudic rule. The Talmud says that Jesus was conceived of a whore. This is the book now of those who call themselves Jews. And that he was conceived of in menstruation and he is eating his own excrement in hell. Now, I'm sorry to have to repeat those, but those are the words that come out of the Talmud. You didn't know that, huh? Well, now you do. The unedited version of the so-called holy book of Judaism. Dr. Compare is a scholar, Dr. Bertrand Compare, who lived a number of years ago. He passed several decades ago, and yet he was a scholar of literary proportions. He was a legal scholar, but also a biblical legal scholar. Right now, we're going to go right to his video, where he shows you the budding or evil fig tree that was planted in Jerusalem in 1948. And now that generation, 70 to 72 years, is about to end, folks. Let's, let's get together and take a peek at Dr. Compare's scholarly work. Today I want to talk about the budding of the fig tree. Many good people are being greatly misled by some sadly mistaken religious propaganda dealing with the Jewish nation which has been created by violence in Palestine. Clergymen who've never studied the subject are bubbling over with enthusiasm over what they regard as a great fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The budding of the fig tree, they say, Israel being restored to its place. Now, you who listen to this program regularly already know that no Jew is an Israelite, and no Israelite is a Jew, and the Jewish nation in Palestine has nothing to do with the real Israel at all. That is too big a subject to repeat today, but you've heard it, and those of you who have written in for our literature have seen the detailed proof of it. The establishment of the Jewish nation in Palestine is the fulfillment of certain Bible prophecies, but these are far different ones than these ignorant and misguided clergymen have in mind. Let's look them over. Nearly all Bible students agree on one thing, that the fig tree is the symbol of the Jewish nation, not Israel, but the Jewish nation. Therefore, let's see what the Bible itself has to say about the budding of the fig tree. Jesus Christ himself told us about this one. It was so important that he not only told a parable about it, but in order to emphasize it, he also acted out the parable. We find this parable in Luke 13, verses 6 to 9, which says, He spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come, seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why does it cumber the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. We know that Jesus Christ was the man who had come for the three years of his ministry and found no fruit on the fig tree, the Jews. They were offered only the brief time remaining through the crucifixion and resurrection for repentance. If they would not accept the truth then, they would soon be cut down. So important was this lesson that he dramatized it by action so that it could not be overlooked. Matthew 21 verses 18 and 19 tells it. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came up to it, and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And he said unto it, 
Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Mark 11, verses 12 to 21, tells the same incident with a little more detail. Remember, from the beginning it has been well understood that the fig tree symbolized the Jewish nation. And Jesus Christ himself said of it, Let no fruit grow on me henceforth forever. This is not the first time that he said this about them. In Matthew 21, verse 43, Jesus Christ said unto the Jews, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The Jews had occupied Palestine then, just as they have now. The place where God had set up his kingdom was in their hands, but they brought forth no fruit, and the kingdom must be put in the hands of those who did produce good fruit, that is, restored to the real Israel, who were then hundreds of miles away on their migration to their new home in Europe. That the real Israel brings forth God's fruit is clear. Isaiah 27 verse 6 tells it. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Again in Hosea 14 verse 8 we read, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. But Jesus Christ himself said that the Jews would not produce any fruit forever. This is what these clergymen have overlooked. What can they base their false claims upon? They misapply Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33, which says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Now Jesus Christ knew scripture far too well to make any mistakes about it or to use it inconsistently. Note that this budding of the fig tree, as the preachers love to call it, is still according to God's prophetic truth. It doesn't bring forth any fruit, only leaves. As Jesus Christ said, let no fruit grow on me henceforth forever. It is not a thing of good bringing forth God's fruit, but a thing of wickedness with the empty promise of leaves but no fruit. True, its timing is very important. It was a sign that the second coming of Jesus Christ is near, even at the doors, and it fits into its place with the other prophecies. In this same 24th chapter of Matthew, verses 3 to 28, Jesus Christ states the seven signs which will indicate the approach of the second coming. The first six of these, this present generation has already seen. These were false prophets and false Christs. Second, great wars of nation against nation, and the kingdom of Satan against the kingdom of God. Third, great famines in several nations, notably Russia, India, and China. Fourth, pestilences. Among them, the great influenza epidemic of 1917-1918, which killed more people than any pestilence in history since the Black Death of the Middle Ages. Fifth, earthquakes in many places, and we have seen many, beginning with San Francisco in 1906, earthquake and tidal wave in Messina, Italy a few years later, one in India in 1925, so severe that an entire city had to be abandoned as the tomb of its population buried in the ruins, and several great earthquakes since then. Sixth, that this gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel of personal salvation, but this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Only in our generation have we seen the worldwide preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, as confirmation of the timing, we do find the fig tree putting forth leaves, not fruit, remember, only leaves in mockery of him who sought fruit on it in vain. So he tells us, when we have seen all these things, we shall know that his return is near, even at the doors. There remains only the seventh and last sign to watch for, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. And when we see this, the climax of the ages will be upon us so swiftly that we can't dawdle around, but must seek shelter quickly. 
This last sign, the abomination which maketh desolate, is a big subject in itself, far too big for the time we now have left for discussion, so we will have to leave that for some other time. But note that of all the signs of Jesus Christ's second coming, only one is in itself good, that the gospel of the kingdom of God shall be preached. All of the other signs are bad. False Christs and false prophets, world wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, and the fig tree putting forth leaves, but no fruit forever. These are all part of Jesus Christ's description of the conditions which would prevail in the world just before his return, which he described as being as it was in the days of Noah. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 11 describes that. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now don't be surprised at all this. God's word is always consistent with itself. If it were not, it couldn't be true. So again, Jesus Christ foretells the fate of this fig tree, which can never bear fruit. In Matthew 7, verses 18 to 20, he said, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So the fig tree, which is now putting forth only leaves, and even that only with our American taxpayers' money, it is a thing of evil, barren of any good, destined to be cut down and cast into the fire, because no fruit can grow on it forever. None of God's people Israel are in it. Then why are the Jews being thus gathered into Palestine? Again, Jesus Christ stated the reason in Luke 19, verse 27, for he said, But those mine enemies that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. The fate of this abortive Jewish nation is included in Christ's words in Matthew 15, verse 13. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up, Therefore we see it in its true light, one of the manifestations of evil which mark the close of this age. Well, we're back again after you just watched the video presentation, just a brief segment of Bible teaching that you probably haven't heard in any of your churches, any of your theological cemeteries, uh, seminaries, excuse me, uh, where they're teaching you fables. They're teaching you the tradition of men of the elders, the learned elders of Zion. You're not being fed the word of God. That's why there are so many agnostics and so many atheists today. I can't blame you. If you're one and you want to know more truth and maybe God's touching your heart today, you're saying, well, you know, I, I, I mean, this guy makes a little sense. He makes a lot of sense because he makes the Bible interpret itself. He doesn't put into the Bible. He and others like Dr. Compare are just giving you word for word what the Bible says. Now it makes a lot of sense. See, those who call themselves Judah and are not but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan is considered blasphemy to our Lord. Blaspheming his word. Yet the so-called Christian churches are packed with people who believe that lie. Now what's happening to these churches today? I'll tell you what's happening to these churches today. They're going belly up. They're consolidating. They're closing. Mm -hmm. The Protestant Bible-believing churches attracted hundreds and thousands of members. Based on John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You see? And yet there are 501c3 churches, tax exempt, people are losing their jobs, they're losing their homes, they're losing everything, thanks to this wonderful, uh, shall we say, Kenite created economic blessing system we have of the Federal Reserve banking criminal regime that created money out of nothing, debt obligations, not money. We have all of this today and the destruction thereof. The dollar is now dropping. 
It is being discontinued on world markets. We're losing the war. America is being destroyed. As America dash true Israel would be destroyed. The Bible does say that this land that God created and God gave the tribes who left ancient Israel. And who are they today? Are they Judah? Judah is one of them. But I don't see anything in the Bible about those who call themselves Jews as being part of the original 13 tribes. I see, <clears throat> excuse me, I see Zebulon. I see Gad, mainly in Italy, northern Italy, Gad. I see Judah, and that includes Germany and Scotland and so on and so forth. I see Norway, Naphtali, the seafaring people. I see the tribe of Dan, the Danes, get it? The Danube, the Donegalites, so on and so forth. Friends, names are there if you want to research them. The names of where the tribes went when they left captivity. Those are the tribes of Israel. You, today, many of you watching, you may be Italian, French, Gad, for instance. You may be Irish, tribes of Israel and Judah, and you don't even know your identity. Who are you worshiping? The enemy, the synagogue of Satan that says it wants to help you. That says all you need to do is just coalesce and create a one world system that will be headquartered from Jerusalem, the city of Antichrist in these days, and just come together in a communitarianism. That is a love fest. All the nation's religions, all the nation's economies, all the nation's political institutions, everything come together, including the one world church of Satan. It won't be called Satan. It'll be called the church of Messiah of Jesus. But which Jesus will it be? Will it be the real Jesus or will it be the fake Jesus? Well, we've already shown you from the Word of God and Dr. Compare said it. It'll be the fake Jesus. His number is 666. Six, six. What does that mean? Well, it means six vials, okay? Six plagues, six trumpets, okay? The sixth seal. The sixth seal is the knowledge of Satan in the minds of the world. What proceeds six? Seven, that's God's number of completion. So 666, if you notice, is the six-pointed triangle of the flag of the state that calls itself Israel. Isn't that interesting? 666. Where is it? Jerusalem. Folks, we're out of time. Study your word. Get into the Gospels and know the truth, because only the truth will set you free. Rick Adams, thanking you for joining me on The Deadly Experiment, saying goodbye, and Yahweh bless his elect. <laughs>